All right, hey everybody. So today we're gonna take a look at curvature and torsion, the two functions that we introduced last video. And we're going to see that in a very real sense, these two functions are the quote unquote natural equations for a space curve in the sense that they completely identify the space curve up to an isometry of R3. Uh, so they are really the two defining functions of a space curve. Now we saw a similar result to this back when we were looking at plane curves or curves in the xy plane, curves in R2. Uh, and so recall that back when we looked in R2, the curvature function kappa g was all that we really needed to know in order to identify our plane curve. In other words, given a function kappa, there existed a parametrized curve, parametrized by unit speed, but a parametrized curve that had that curvature function as its curvature. Uh, and furthermore, this was unique up to an isometry or a rigid motion in the plane. Uh, and so we can ask the question, R3 seems more complicated. Uh, we have these two functions now, curvature and torsion. Uh, what can we say about parametrized curves in R3? And what we get is a result that sort of mimics this one, but is a little bit more technical, a little bit more complicated, because we are working with more complicated systems of equations. Uh, and so we end up with the following result, which we call the fundamental theorem of space curves, or the fundamental theorem of curves in R3. Uh, so it's going to look very similar, like we said. Uh, first, given any two functions, kappa of s and uh, tau of s, right, with the specification that kappa is a non-negative function, uh, so it's greater than, I think I should say greater than or equal to 0. Uh, and given that each of these functions are C1 and defined on a common domain, uh, which we'll call an interval J, there exists a smaller interval I and a parametrized curve defined over I for which, in this parametrized curve, our curvature function is kappa and our torsion function is tau. All right. And we'll get to the furthermore in just a moment. But first, I want to point out, this is a little bit subtler and, like we said, a little more technical than our last fundamental theorem. right? And the real uh, sort of thing to highlight here, I think, is first, uh, we have a few extra assumptions. So we have this assumption that our curvature function has to be non-negative, and also that our curvature and torsion functions each have to be C1. Right, which I think is, is slightly stronger than our previous assumption, which was just that the curvature was a continuous function. So here, we have that each of these are C1, and we have to have them defined on a common interval J. So we have these additional assumptions. And then our conclusion is slightly more technical. We're no longer saying that our parametrized curve is defined on the entire interval J, but rather, that we know for sure that there's some subinterval, some smaller interval contained in J, right? So given this J, there's a smaller interval I on which a parametrized curve can be well defined with the curvature function and torsion function as given on I, right? So slightly more technical assumptions and definitely a slightly more technical uh, conclusion that we can draw in this part here. The uh, there exists a smaller interval i, right? So those are definitely a little more technical. Uh, however, we do get this nice uh, sort of concluding remark that does nicely mirror what we had in R2. We can say, furthermore, any two curves that have the same curvature and same torsion functions are, in fact, the same up to an isometry of R3. So we do have this uniqueness of curves up to isometry. So this is indeed saying that curvature and torsion are our two defining functions. If we happen to know of a curve with a certain curvature and a certain torsion function, any other curve with the same curvature and torsion will really be the same curve, maybe just moved around in three-dimensional space somehow. Um, but yeah, we want to get into this proof a little bit. We want to talk about why this is a slightly more technical, more delicate proof. Um, and so I'm going to talk through this proof uh, right now. And so maybe first a, a remark. Uh, this proof 
will necessarily rely on some advanced mathematics uh, that we don't necessarily want to cover in this video. Specifically, we will use uh, facts that stem from the system uh, theory of systems of differential equations, as well as theory of linear algebra. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about the linear algebra, but the system of differential equations, the result that we're going to use, is a very deep result that we won't get into uh, in this class. However, it is worth saying this deep result uh, is a real lifesaver for us. We couldn't make this argument without it. And it is also going to be where a lot of the technicality of this theorem come from, right? So the restriction of the interval, the fact that our kappa and tau have to be C1, these are really going to be baked into this, uh, sis the theory that we draw on from systems of differential equations. And so there will, will be a moment in the proof when it feels a little magical or hand wavy uh, or what have you. But just know that that's where this is coming from. OK. So that being said, though, let's get into the proof and understand at least the flavor of the proof and, and figure out as much as we can. Uh, our ultimate goal, right, given a kappa of s and a tau of s, our big goal is to say that there is a parametrized curve, capital X, that exists on some interval of time with that curvature function and with that torsion function. Um, this is the main object that we're looking for. But while I'm at it, I'm also going to identify my Frenet frame. So my uh, unit tangent, uh, principal unit normal, and then unit binormal vectors as well. Um, right? Once I have my curve, I have these three. right? Or I could calculate these three. And indeed, finding these three can help us identify what x is. So I'm sort of going to be, my, my big goal is to find x, but I'm really looking for all four of these at the same time. Uh, and it gets just a little more complicated because, remember, these are all vector valued functions in R3. So my capital X really has three components, an x, y, and z, which I can write in, in my vector notation. And so I get x1, uh, x2, and x3 as stand-ins for my x-coordinate, y-coordinate, and z-coordinate. And each of these are really functions of time, right? So this is really looking for an x1, x2, and x3 of time, aka an x of t, y of t, and z of t. Similarly, right, my t, p, and b are all vector valued. Uh, and so each of those is really three functions of their own, right? A t1, t2, t3, p1, p2, p3, b1, b2, b3. So there are really 12 functions here that are unknown to me. And my goal is really to find, you know, again, specifically these three, but really all 12 would be useful. So there are 12 unknown functions here. OK. So from our previous work, we actually have a lot of information about the derivatives of these functions. Right? So first of all, we, had, we calculated x prime way, way back. And we used that to calculate t. And so we got this equation that x prime was really s prime times t. And then recently, in our work with curvature and torsion, we were able to calculate t prime, b prime, and then finally p prime. Oh, and I see here, I should make this b prime. Right? We were able to calculate these three expressions as well. Uh, and we got these uh, functions of curvature and torsion as a result. So right, again, our goal is to calculate our x, t, p, and b. So a lot of the expressions in here are unknown. But we do know what kappa is. right? This is kappa of t. This is a function kappa. We have tau of t, another function. And if we are looking for a unit speed curve, right, or a curve that's parametrized by unit speed, we know that we want to use our parameter s, and in particular, that our speed, s prime, right, is just going to be equal to 1. So with a unit speed parameterization, each of these equations just becomes a little bit simpler right off the bat. And that's great. Right? So now we have these four equations that we're looking at. But again, right, we have these four equations. Each of these is vector valued, right? So every time I write an x, I can really think of it as being as describing three different functions, x1, x2, x3. And so if I take these four vector valued equations and write them in terms of their components, what I really get 
are these 12 functions as a result, right? Are these 12 uh, equations, these 12 differential equations, right? So in particular, my equation x prime equals t becomes these three equations here in which the first components x or the x vectors first component's derivative is equal to the first component of my t vector, second component is equal to second component, third component is equal to third component, right? So unpacking these four equations, what I really get are 12 different equations. And this is a system of differential equations, a system of differential equations in which, sort of scanning through all of this, we have two functions that are known, kappa of s and tau of s are known, but all of the other functions, the other 12 functions, right, the xi's, ti's, pi's, and bi's are all unknown functions with unknown derivatives. So what we have here are a lot of unknown functions sort of anchored throughout by uh, these kappas and these taus, and this is a system of differential equations in which there are 12 equations, right, involving these 12 first derivatives. So this is the moment where a little bit of magic happens, because this would be really challenging for us to address in this class. However, we can lean on some theory of systems of differential equations. And the theory says that if we have a system of differential equations that looks like this, and if our kappa and tau functions are at least C1, so they're you know, at least differentiable with continuous first derivative, then on a restricted domain, and here I should just scroll up here, right? If we choose a specific starting point, right, a sort of anchoring point at let's say s equals zero, we can restrict the domain and be guaranteed that on some restricted domain, a solution does exist and a unique solution at that. Right? So again, in a slightly hand wavy way to refer to the systems of differential equations, what we get is that on a restricted domain, this system actually has a solution and we can solve for our bi's, our pi's, our ti's, and then most importantly, our xi's, which will give us our coordinate functions x of t, y of t, and z of t. Right? Now, in particular, if we have, again, we sort of have this, this system of equations, if we uh, guarantee some initial conditions at time s equals zero, this will determine our solution uniquely on this interval i. And so this is where we get not only our existence and uniqueness, uh, I should say not only our existence, but our uniqueness up to isometry. Because if we look here, right, once I've specified the initial conditions, I get a unique curve. And so any other curve with the same kappa and same tau must be, you know, we could go through a similar process, just possibly with different initial conditions. And these initial conditions will exactly determine this isometry that we're talking about. So specifically, changing any of these, the x1, x2, or x3, that will change our location in space Right, so that's our location in space. And so changing that would be equivalent to translating our curve, moving it in three-dimensional space from one place to the other. That's an isometry. And then these three taken together, right? Well, these three determine our starting orientation for our Frenet frame. So which direction is my T pointing in? which direction is my p pointing in, and which direction is my b pointing in. And once I've identified those three directions, I have sort of the starting direction and the starting orientation of my space curve. So this is the, the direction, aka the orientation that we start with. And so we can see that by changing the initial conditions, what we'll end up getting is the same curve, just with a different starting point and different orientation. But everything else will remain the same. Now, that is essentially the proof, or at least as much of the proof that, that I would like to talk through. But there is one potential issue that we should talk to, talk about, right? This final step. Uh, is our answer really 
an answer, right? Does this have the, the physical interpretation, the geometric interpretation that we're really hoping for? What I mean by that is, is going back a step, right? This theory that we are referring to guarantees us a solution to this system of equations, right? In other words, we, by using the theory, what we get is a guaranteed existence of a function, x1, x2, x3, a function, t1, t2, t3, p1, p2, p3, b1, b2, b3. These functions exist, but do they still have the same geometric interpretation that we're hoping they do? And I wanna focus specifically on these last three here, because here's where we can have some trouble or run into some trouble. Our initial conditions that we set up, right, our choice of T, P, and B, initially guaranteed that these three formed an orthonormal basis, right, aka they formed a, a frame. They were all orthogonal to each other and they all had unit length. We really need to make sure that as we get new functions, right, new T1, T2, T3, P1, P2, P3, and B1, B2, B3, we really need to make sure that this orthogonality is maintained, right? That these three vectors continue to form an orthonormal basis. It is at least theoretically possible, or we shouldn't discount the possibility, that we would be given a solution to this, so we'd get 12 functions, fantastic. But somewhere along the way, all of a sudden, these collections of functions, right? The t's, the p's, and the b's, no longer form an orthonormal basis. And then all of a sudden, we've lost this, this geometry, right? We have functions that are solutions, but they're not describing what we want them to describe somehow. So in order to guarantee that this actually is describing a curve, we should make sure that our t's, p's, and b's continue to form an orthonormal basis as we go forward. So do they? Yes, they do. It turns out that it's okay and that this will work for us. We will continue to have an orthonormal basis going forward. Uh, and this is true by properties of linear algebra. Now, I want to talk through this um, because it's awesome, because it's really cool to see this in action. Uh, so this, uh, from this point on in the video, this is, this is optional for those of you who have taken a little bit of linear algebra and are interested. Uh, those of you who have not uh, taken as much linear algebra, we'll talk about some, some ideas, state them as facts that, uh, you know, would have been discussed in a linear algebra class. You are totally invited to keep watching. You shouldn't feel obligated to. And if you keep watching and feel uh, like you haven't seen a lot of these, these facts, don't let yourself feel overwhelmed. Um, but let's take a look and see why this is true using facts of linear algebra. Okay, so into our sort of optional linear algebra stuff. This is going to come from a number of different facts about matrices, some of which uh, we'll take for granted as sort of taught in a linear algebra class, some of which we will recall and prove here. Uh, and so there's, there's a number of things that we want to notice. First of all, recall that if we have a solution to our curve, um, or if we have a solution to the equations on the previous slides, they will not only satisfy the equations that we listed back there, but we can write it compactly in a nice matrix form, right? And we saw this uh, several videos ago that our functions will satisfy m prime equals m times a as a matrix equation, where m was equal to this equation of, or this uh, matrix of nine functions. m prime is just the derivative of this, and a was this matrix right here. All right, so this is just another way to write our system of equations in matrix notation. However, there are some really nice things that we can observe about these matrices, right? And I guess I wanna observe, yeah, just a few quick things. The first is that this matrix A is anti-symmetric, right? And what I mean by that is that if we take the transpose of A, we'll end up getting negative A as a result. So anti-symmetric means that A transpose 
is equal to negative a. Awesome. Uh, we can just quickly check that for ourselves. Uh, our matrix M, at least initially, is an orthogonal matrix. Right? So it turns out that M of 0 is orthogonal right? And as a reminder, a matrix is orthogonal if we have m transpose times m equal to the identity matrix. And in this case, that's the identity matrix of size 3. Right? So why is this matrix orthogonal? Well, it's because the columns form an orthonormal basis of R3. Right? So anytime we have an orthonormal basis of R3, we can create a matrix, and it will be an orthogonal matrix. Right? That's actually not just true of R3, but here we'll focus on the R3 case. So we have an orthogonal matrix made up of orthonormal uh, basis vectors. We have an anti-symmetric matrix, and we have that our functions satisfy this equation. And so what does that all give us? Well, I'll state it as a fact that if a is anti-symmetric, if m prime is equal to m a, and if m is orthogonal at time 0, right, time s equals 0, then m will remain orthogonal for all time going forward, right, or I guess going backward. It will be orthogonal for all time. And at that point, right, we'll have this orthogonal matrix, and so we'll know that t p and b continue to form an orthonormal basis. Now, why is this fact true? Let's prove this fact, turn it into a theorem. Uh, we know that m transpose times m is equal to the identity at time 0. What we will show is that the derivative of that expression, m transpose times m, is actually equal to 0. And so what does that mean? Well, if the derivative is equal to 0, then that quantity is not changing in time, right? It's not changing as s changes. And that means that m transpose times m will always equal the identity matrix for any time s. And in, you know, uh, what that will imply is that m is always orthogonal, and therefore the columns t, p, and b will continue to form an orthonormal basis. So once we're able to show that this is true, we will be good to go. So the final question that we have is, why is this true? Right? Why is uh, the derivative of m transpose time times m equal to 0? Well, to get there, we have to calculate. So let's actually take the derivative. And looking forward, we'll take the derivative, and we'll want to use the one fact that we haven't used yet. And that's that m prime is equal to m a. So let's see if we can take this derivative and use that fact in a meaningful way. So we're going to start by taking the s derivative of m transpose times m. By rules of matrix multiplication, this should be m transpose prime times m plus m transpose times m prime, right? Matrix multiplication will have this product rule uh, associated with it. But that, right? First, let's, let's rewrite this. m transpose prime is really equal to m prime transpose. There's no difference when you take the derivative before or after you've transposed the matrix. So we really have this equation. And now we can use our fact that m prime is equal to m a. So we end up with m prime. Every time we see an m prime, let's replace that with an m a. So we end up with this equation. And m a transpose is really equal to, right? Remember when we take a matrix multiplication and then we take a transpose, this is really equal to A transpose, M transpose, right? So MA transpose equals A transpose, M transpose. 
times m plus m transpose times m times a. And now we're basically home free, right? Because we've got, switch out the color here, m transpose times m in each of these cases is just going to be the identity matrix. And a was anti-symmetric, which means that a transpose is just negative a. So what do we end up with at the end of all of this? We end up with negative a times i, so that's just negative a, plus i times a, so that's just a. And so the whole thing does, in fact, equal the zero matrix. Right? And so what have we done? We've shown that this quantity is unchanging in s. Its s derivative is equal to 0. And therefore, m is always an orthogonal matrix. And our vectors, t, p, and b, are always going to form an orthonormal basis. So in conclusion, by using this sort of slick linear algebra style proof, we are able to show, uh, whoops, there we go. We are able to show that these continue to form an orthonormal basis, and therefore they continue to have the geometric significance that we hope they do, that we hoped they would, and therefore that our system of equations does describe a Frenet frame and a parametrized curve x with the given curvature and torsion functions as we hoped. Awesome.